Hey everyone, in this section what we want to do is talk about Newton's laws for rotation. And really they're no different than any of Newton's laws we've talked about before. Like Newton's first law here, when objects are at rest, they tend to stay at rest. When objects are in motion, or in this case rotational motion, or when things are spinning, they want to continue spinning. And just like in first law of motion before, both of these cases will always be obeyed. You will either be at rest or you will continue spinning at a nice constant angular velocity unless there's an outside net force. The force this time we saw today in lab, what causes things to change their motion and ch causes things to accelerate in rotation is a torque. So unless there's an unbalanced net torque on the object, then objects will keep doing what they were doing. Like the Earth, there is no force that is causing a torque on the Earth. So what we see is the Earth continues to spin every day in pretty much the same amount of time. So let's look at an example of that. Over here on the wheel, the wheel is at rest and will remain at rest as long as there's no outside net force or torque. So to put a torque on the object, I must grab the object and put a force on it. Now if you look, there really wasn't any motion. There's some slight motion there, but we talked about this today too. To apply torque, you've got to put a force on an object and it's got to be at a distance from the axis. So I did apply a force in that first example there, but I wasn't far away from the axis. If I'm far from the axis here and I apply my force, now you can see that the object is in motion and those two bugs want to stay in motion. They will continue to spin unless there's an outside net torque. So if you look, they do have nice linear velocities. The green bug has a larger linear velocity than the red bug, and that's just due to a larger radius. The bigger the radius, the larger the tangential velocity. Remember, both of these have the same angular velocity. They're both rotating the same amount of revolutions or radians, every single second. And if you look at it, their net acceleration right now is inwards. Because their rotational speed is constant, there's no reason to have any outside tangential acceleration. The only acceleration they experience right now is the change in their direction, which is their centripetal acceleration. Watch what happens when I put on the brake. The brake here is going to apply a force to the wheel, and when it applies a force to the wheel, outside net torque takes away all our motion. And it happened pretty quick there, but I'll get this spinning again. Let's get it spinning in the opposite direction now. So now I have the wheel spinning in the opposite direction here. Follow right hand rule. If you follow right hand rule, you can see your thumb is pointing into the screen, which means that this is the negative direction. The first one was a positive direction. And in order to decrease inward motion, there's got to be a torque in the opposite direction or an unbalanced force going against this motion. So to have a torque coming towards me, watch what happens when I apply the brake again. Now the force is against the motion causing your velocity to decrease. And one other thing this simulation does show is watch the accelerations as I make this go faster or slower. So right now we said this is an inward centripetal acceleration. When I put the brake on, you can see the acceleration lags behind the bugs because that is the net acceleration. It still has V squared over R inwards, but it also has a tangential acceleration back against it. When I speed it up, the acceleration heads off in front of the bug because there's a linear tangential acceleration as well as a centripetal acceleration. So the net acceleration is the combination of both accelerations. So that then brings us to second law for rotation. And Newton's second law says that in order to make something rotate, there must be a force applied. Or, like we said before, force makes masses accelerate. But in this case, now we are rotating. So we are angularly accelerating. For rotation, we saw that your force needs to be applied tangent to the circle. And to get the most rotation possible in today's lab, 
we had to have the force at the biggest distance from the axis. So the biggest distance from the axis gives us the largest torque. Bigger torques require big forces. Bigger lines of R, and what that means is the distance away from the rotation point and the angle between the two, and we showed that as well. The angle must be 90 degrees from the radius or the line of R to the force. So torque happens for the top pitcher from F2 and F1. And if you look at that, those two torques are going to make that spin in the counterclockwise direction, which will give it a positive torque and a positive angular motion. Down here, there is no torque. And the reason there's no torque is if you look at the angle between my radius and my force, the angle between my radius and force is zero degrees or 180 degrees. And when you do that, there is no net torque whatsoever. So if we want to calculate a torque, we have to have a tangential force acting a radius from the circle. And yes, the angle does matter. To give yourself the most torque possible, you have to have the angle being 90 degrees. Because if you do the sine of 90, the sine of 90 becomes 1, and you get force times radius again. So torques are force times radius. The units there are newton meter. And like we talked about, that is not a joule. That is just the force times the distance away from the axis point. It's a newton times a meter, but not a joule. And from what we're our lab today, we saw that the angular acceleration will increase as torques are applied to the objects. A torque and angular acceleration are related to each other. And how they're related to each other is what we're going to uncover with the slope of your line from tonight. So do your angular acceleration versus torque, calculate your slope, and tomorrow we'll discuss what the meaning is behind that slope. A couple of drawings and examples of torques here. You can see there's a rod that is attached to point A, and there's a force off at an angle. So the, again, the force that we only care about to create the torque is the one that is tangent to the circle. The one that is parallel with the circle will do absolutely nothing and not move the object whatsoever. So we want this tangential force, not the parallel force. So why do plumbers have really large wrenches? Well, when they're trying to apply big rotations to pipes, your hands may not provide enough force. So what you do is you attach a long rod to the end of the pipe and you pull, apply the force as far away from the pipe as possible. This creates a very large torque and that very large torque will make the pipe spin very, very easily. Again, looking at the axis point at point A and R being our radius away, if the force is applied on this red arrow here, this angled force, I can break apart the components and all I really want is the tangential force. The tangential force is what makes us angularly accelerate. Same with this scenario. No matter what the line of action is, you look at a distance from that line of action and find the angle between the force and the line of action. Those must be 90 degrees for you to have any type of torque whatsoever. So right here with the simulation again, I'm allowed to pick a force that I want to put on the wheel and I'll pick a force of around 1.25 newtons. I can pick a radius for that force to act on the object and when I do that, I can hit go, and you can see that, yes, now my object is starting to pick up speed because of my net torque. If I want this thing to go at steady speed, I have to have a net torque of zero. Well, right now, the applied torque is 2.56 newton meters. There is no braking torque, so what I'm going to try to do is increase the braking torque to give me about the same exact torque in the opposite direction. And if I hit go now, what you can see is my net torque here is flatlining at zero. My applied torque and my braking torque are equal and opposite, which means my wheel will spin at a nice constant angular velocity. It will not increase speed, it will not decrease speed, it'll just stay the same the entire trip. If I want to decrease the motion here, I just make the braking torque even larger. So increasing that braking torque 
means that there's more torque in one direction than the other direction and the wheel is decreasing its angular velocity until we get to the stop point. So the way you can kind of think of this is that the braking torque is like a force of friction. It is causing changes in your angular motion and trying to decrease your angular motion as time goes on. What your body will respond to, what the wheel will respond to is the net torque on the object. The torque from you minus the torque from any other object trying to make the object rotate the other way. If there are more than one torque in the same direction, it's just going to add to your positive net torque and make the object spin even faster in that direction. But when they're opposite, the net torque makes us angularly accelerate.